What's up tweener heads? Welcome back to another tweener head tennis video today here on our channel. If you are new to the channel, hey, how's it going? My name's Phil and this is where we talk about tennis in a more casual way for you guys to find out what's going on on and off the court. And today we have a very special video with former USC Trojan coach Peter Smith who led the team to 16 NCAA appearances and four consecutive NCAA team titles. Now the coach of Sam Query and Steve Johnson. We got to talk to the coach about his coaching experience in college and transitioning into the pros, as well as his experience working with professional athletes like Steve Johnson that he's known since his USC days, as well as another American, Sam Queer. Now, he's currently in the bubble in New York, so we hope he stays safe and we hope he has a successful tournament with Sam and Steve. So make sure to go check him out in the links down below. And I hope you guys do enjoy this interview with one of the best, in my opinion, college coaches of all time. Here we go, our interview with Peter Smith. I was born in Europe and moved there when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And then my dad retired when I was 13. And my mom started the car and said, you can get in mm -hmm. <laughs> or, you, or you can stay. Along. Yeah, and my dad smartly got in the car and we moved to North County, San Diego. Very nice. Where so I had a super, super cool childhood because I grew up playing ice hockey and skiing and then moved to La Costa Country Club when I was 13. And okay had Pancho Segura's influence, and so, yeah, I, love, I had the best of all the world. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you, uh, where were you born in Europe? Rome. Oh, very nice. I, uh, I grew up in Florence for most of my life. I actually grew up in uh, Florence for seven years. Wow, so I've got the saddest story, so. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> great story. No, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a, a funny story. Okay. Um, I was born in Rome, but I was supposed to be a girl. <laughs> so they didn't have a boy's name. Okay. I mean, back then, I think it was less than a science picking okay. the sex. And so I was born, and they didn't have a boy's name. So I was, I was baptized in St. Peter's Church. Fantastic. So they named me Peter. Oh, wow. And, and the sad part about it mm -hmm. is I've never been back to Italy. Really? So I left when I was two weeks old. So I was super excited to go back this year with Sam Query or Steve Johnson mm -hmm. and actually had it put in my kind of agreement with the Jack Kramer club that I could go there. But I don't even know if Rome's going to happen at this point. And I don't know if I want to go because, because of everything. I mean, yeah, I'm in New York right now mm -hmm. and I'm literally quarantined to my hotel room for 24 hours before I pass the test. And you're not allowed to go to a tournament match before you pass two tests. So got it. It's really not not a very fun experience. Although I do have room service, so well, that's that's the, the small victories are what really matters, <laughs> I guess now because it's. But I've never I've never been told I have to go to a place and I can't leave it. So it's kind of hilarious, actually. I mean, they literally escort you to your room and really? say you can't leave until you get a you know, negative tests. I, I couldn't imagine having a positive test because then you're you're in your room for 10 days. I'd like to see how fat I came out of here <laughs> after 10 days. Well, do you... So are you there with Steve or Sam? I'm here with both. Oh, okay. So I have a, have a contract with both of them. You know, I have a long relationship with Stevie and then entered into an agreement with Sam in February... Mm -hmm. So I've coached him since the beginning of February, but we have not been to a tournament together. Gotcha. How strange is that? You coach a pl pro it's player so for six months it's, and don't go to a tournament. So it, it's it'll very, be interesting. It's very interesting to see your dynamic as well, because from a player's perspective, they can train, they can do their own thing when they're at home, once they clear their tests or whatever they need to do before they go back onto a court. But for you... From a coaching standpoint, you can only do it remotely. Is that correct? Like what from, do you mean? Like from home, like over the phone, watching film. Like, or are you clo living close to them where you can go to a court together? Oh, no. We've been, we've been on court a, a okay. ton. Oh, my gotcha. God, a ton. Gotcha. So, yeah, I mean, fortunately for them and for me, um, you know, and they have tons of contacts, you know, not that I'm the only one <laughs> that I had access to stuff like this, but all during the pandemic, we had we had a couple different private courts that we we're hitting on. Okay. 
So we had practice partners. You know, fortunately, my sons were <laughs> not doing too much, and you know, it was it was a as as good a situation as as they could have had uh, mm-hmm. during that crazy time. And well, it's you know, it's still crazy. So, but yeah, they they were able to get all their practice reps in, and I was on court with them. And you mm-hmm. know, I coach Steve with Mark Lucero, so nice. most of the time, both Mark and I were there. And it, it's it's been a as as in a, such a bad situation. It's been for them kind of a you know a good situation where they can at least still practice Mm -hmm. i can totally understand especially now was world team tennis very helpful for them or were you following that closely to kind of monitor what they need to work on going into the u.s open um it was hard to monitor to be quite honest okay um yeah i i'm not i'm not living in a basement Okay. Um, so I was TiVoing all the, all the world, world team tennis matches that I could, and it was actually on a lot, Yeah. but you know, I watched maybe four okay. sets from each of them. And I mean, world team tennis is super exciting, especially in person. I think it's actually a really a fun format, but in terms of development, it's, it's really tough to try and. Mm-hmm. understand because you know it's a when they're used to you know running like a five mile race that's kind of like a, a mile race it's just a sprint you know it's no ad scoring first to five whoever gets hot you know it, it's hard to understand having said that i think it was incredible for them to play you know they made some bucks they got put in some you know tight situations so they got their emotional side trained a little bit Mm -hmm. and and we'll see you know but i but i do think it was a really great experience for them do you think from a coaching perspective the world team tennis fast format that they have benefits their overall game no matter what not just from a let's play a set but from a like you were saying, it's a it's a marathon, not a sprint. But maybe the sprint helps sometimes, or you can take away a lot more, a lot quicker. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's it's you know certainly a part of it. And, mm-hmm. and and they got home, and and we've played a lot of practice sessions with three plus sets since okay. they've been back with ad scoring. And so, you know, you come to you know we're going to play the Western Open this week and U S open three out of five next week. So it was just really important that, you know, I mean, it's always important to train like different sides, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm sure even not that I'm a marathon runner, but even a marathon runner works on their finish, right. Their sprint finish. So, you know, I think always working on different sides of it. And I think they both had a lot of fun. I mean, Greenbrier is a beautiful place and in this weird, weird time to go somewhere for three and a half weeks and, and just focus on tennis and not have to travel mm-hmm. was really, really a, a good thing for their, for their tennis. Have you always, uh, have you been a more hands-on type of coach? You'll point out things in between points, or do you kind of let Sam and Steve figure out what they need to do over the duration of the match? Because from you've known Steve a, maybe a lot longer than maybe Sam since you coached him in college. So what was What's your coaching mentality like when it comes to maybe on-court coaching? Well, I'm used to coaching juniors and college players, and and these are grown men, so it's definitely very different, and Mm -hmm. I am not nitpicking in between points. You know, you you pick and choose. I I, I think the worst thing, I I think in coaching particularly, there's too much overcoaching. Okay. And I think there's too much coaching talking about what they did wrong. And mm-hmm. I've always coached in terms of what they do right. Okay. Um, I think, I think the, you know, and I think you can walk by any junior match and watch a parent. And, and certainly I was one of those parents too. You can't help help it with the bad nonverbal language and things like that. <laughs> but I do think, you know, a lot of people out there are focusing on, Hey, what can, my my person do better 
mm-hmm. uh, instead of what does my person do really well? And, you know, I think that's a very big positive and, and people don't look at the emotional component to tennis, but, you know, pointing out what people do right mm-hmm. and building on what people do right, I think is the most positive way and the most effective way to coach tennis. And sometimes you just have to be more patient, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know, in a practice session that lasts two hours, I can promise you everybody's going to do something right. Mm-hmm. And then when they do that thing that is right then you say here that's what you should be doing that's a good thing keep it up do that Mm -hmm. you know and that's a that's just a way to reinforce what you want them to do instead of they miss a shot and you're saying oh no that's wrong you know so it's just about building that kind of that spirit that they have inside of them because Mm -hmm. tennis is such a unforgiving sport because it is so focused on on sometimes on mistakes Mm -hmm. and so when you focus as a coach on those mistakes especially with young kids Mm -hmm. it can really break them down emotionally so you know as as parents and uh, well every every parent is is somewhat a a coach right we're all kind of life coaches and you got to it's a real test. <laughs> yeah. We get tested every day, but you got to focus on what they're doing right and build on what they're doing right. And you can, you can create that person that you want by focusing on what's doing right. And, and, you know, build your player or your child up emotionally mm-hmm. by focusing on what, what is correct instead of telling them what they do wrong. I mean, anybody can, you know, it's not hard to tell somebody, oh, you did this, this, and this wrong. You mm-hmm. missed the backhand. You know, that that's that's pretty elementary coaching. Oh, of course. It seems pretty straightforward, too, because you're not really giving them anything that is coachable. You're just telling them a fact, and it's hard to yeah. adapt from that yeah. moment. Yeah, so the, the, the body language that we portray on the sideline Mm-hmm. that I tried to do for years and years of college coaching is, you know, never lose your cool. Mm-hmm. Always look calm on the outside, even though you're going crazy on the inside <laughs> and, and project, project that to your, to your player. But, but, you know, in coaching Steve and Sam, I mean, they're grown men. So yeah. it, it it is, you know, if I'm going to nitpick or do anything, you know, that's, that's just going to be a mistake. But, you know, we have, we have bigger discussions off the court okay. and then, and then you want to try and, you know, build on those during the practice session. But, you know, I mean, sometimes it's a joke in between a point, mm-hmm. you know, it's, you got to make the environment great. Yeah. And so, uh, but yeah, sometimes there's reminders, you know, sometimes, you know, but they know what they're doing right and wrong. It's, mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're pros that play a lot of tennis. They know their games, but getting them to look at the overall picture is, is super important. So I was about to ask, when you, the transition from, you left USC, I believe, last year. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, you left USC. You started working with Steve and Sam. What was that biggest transition like besides maybe the traveling and the more, I guess, time away from your family? Uh, to from coaching college where you had a set team you had a set assistant plan with pros it can vary from week to week depending on how they're playing what was the biggest transition like to coaching professional yeah I, I guess I guess the one thing and and I knew this instinctively and, and knew it because I heard it and knew it because Steve and I had talked about it over the years but how different each week can be Okay. I, I mean, it's it's incredible how different the balls can make a week. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they, they have slow balls, they have quick balls, but each week they're playing with very different balls yeah. and how different the surfaces are and how different, you know, the conditions are. It, it's crazy. And how many adjustments 
these guys really have to make. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, Steve, you know, won a challenger on a Saturday, and then on Monday it was playing Federer first round of the Australian Open. I mean, <laughs> it's it's tough enough to you know change that level, mm-hmm. uh, which you know, but then to also change surfaces. You know, he went from extremely hot conditions mm-hmm. uh, during the day to an indoor you know, because they closed the roof mm-hmm. night match. I mean, it was like totally different tennis two days later. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just incredible how, how that, the whole thing changes week to week. Uh, and that depends on the court surface, the balls, and, and the overall condition of the tournament. So, you know, and, and how much, I mean, I think, I think Steve played, eight out of the first nine weeks and, you know, just going to different countries, different parts of the U S extremely, extremely different in the little adjustments you need to make. And, you know, you're tired and, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's why you can see guys have better weeks and, you know, that's, that to me is interesting. And then also, you know, the point of these guys are grown men Mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they're basically, you know, they do their own thing and, they don't need to, you know, have many life lessons because mm-hmm. they've learned a lot of them already. Yeah, and it seems like Steve is one of those that really grinds on the court. And like you said, he played the first eight out of the first nine weeks of the year. And do you, from a scheduling standpoint, do you think that's the right idea for some players? I know you're used to it with Steve. Do you think people should be playing every two weeks, every week from tournament to tournament, or do you think there should be a longer rest for them? Yeah. I I mean, I don't think there's any guideline and and I Mm -hmm. would, I would, I would not use that word grind with Steve, but (laughs) Steve finished, finished the 2019 season, not playing a lot. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, his goal to start the 2020 season was to play a lot. And, you know, he had, he had a full two months off, which is extraordinary in tennis world, uh, you know, and, and he's, you know, Steve has played, I think he's played 35 straight majors. He's been main draw of 35 straight majors. That's an incredible record. And Unreal I think the, staff. the second, second most active, uh, you know, and no one ever talks about that. So he hasn't had many breaks in his career. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, him getting, you know, I know, Sam last year had like 10 days off. It was crazy how little time he had off. So, you know, then Sam had, you know, had a child to begin the year. So, you know, Sam's only played, I think, one tournament this year. Mm -hmm. Um, So you just never know. It just depends on the situation. Um, Every player is a little different. And and Steve and Sam are are very different people and have different games. And, you know, it's just, you know, they're coordinating that with their agent and, Mm -hmm. You know, and and their coaches, so they're taking a little bit in. But you know, how are they feeling physically? How are they feeling emotionally? Mm-hmm. So a lot of that goes into the into the recipe, of course. And when you talk about Sam and Steve, they have two different games, and I think from my perspective, going from one player to another, it's kind of like in college. You always have to adapt to however they play. What's the strategy coaching Sam versus what's the strategy versus coaching Steve? Yeah, I don't know if I want to say all of those nuances, but <laughs> I would, I would, I would agree that they're very different people with mm-hmm. very different games, and they need to be handled differently. And but they also they also can change week to week. You know, mm-hmm. you just don't know. Um, so and I and I do like the comparison to college coaching because Mm -hmm. you can you know be on your number two guy's court and walk over to the number three guy's court and you have to adapt your personality to that Mm -hmm. and so doing that for 32 years definitely helped me uh i certainly have a certain personality so you know it's i can't be mr hyde and dr jekyll um (laughs) although my kids would probably disagree with that statement um but you know you know, you just you you have to bring to the table what you think helps them the most, and and that also is a discussion 
with with the player and and some of the important people around the player. Mm-hmm. So it, to me, it's going to be super interesting for me, and I'm I'm really excited to be a part of Sam's matches coming up because you know Sam has a, a has a great support team as does Steve, and they have these great support systems around. So you know, and like Sam has a Christian, uh, you know, a physical therapist uh, type trainer that has a great, you know, understanding of Sam and Mm -hmm. he's at the same agent. You know, they've had a ton of consistency um, in their playing careers. Mm -hmm. You know, they've had the same agents, you know, they've kept the same people around them a a lot. So, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see what it's like to be with Sam in a tournament environment. I think it's definitely an exciting challenge for you going forward, especially now that you're in the bubble. You get to be very close to them, and that's always a plus. I mean, the bubble's not really going to allow you to do anything, really, besides be with your players. So it might be getting to know them maybe a little bit too much, but maybe enough where you get to find out certain things that can really elevate their game. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't think I can get to know any player better than I know Steve uh, <laughs> Very true. because I've been with him so much and you know good times bad times all that uh, but yeah I mean we'll see about the bubble you know I brought some backgammon and <laughs> you know so I, it, it's just interesting I, it should... I wore a mask all day yesterday and I was curious how hard that was going to be what'd you think and, and actually it, was, it wasn't too bad I've worn yeah. a mask more yeah. lately uh, but yeah it's yeah, it's all <laughs> it's all interesting, and, and it's a it's a blessing, and I know it's a really tough time for a lot of people in the world, and mm-hmm. so it's a blessing that we are able to do what we do. I I totally agree, and I'm I think everyone should be very fortunate to be in the situations that we are. Me being able to cover the sport of tennis from my from the comfort of my own home, you having the ability to be in a safe environment with your two players, uh, living. A, good and healthy life and I think the last thing or one of the last things I wanted to talk to you about is you had a quote from a website called Tennis Takes where you said you shouldn't be homeschooling your kids until their last year of high school a busy kid is a kid who doesn't have time to get into trouble which I love the last part I have to say a busy kid is not a kid who has time to get into trouble but I wanted to ask you about the homeschooling part when I was growing up um, overseas a lot of the kids that I was competing with at the club were kids that were spending maybe six, eight hours on court or at the gym while I was at school for most of that time, and then I would only be training maybe three, four hours after school. What's your take on kids that were – do you think kids that were homeschooled and trained more definitely had an advantage over kids that maybe had a, a more normal life? Well, you know, first of all, I'd like to qualify any statement that I make that is super important that a lot of times I speak generally, mm-hmm. uh, not specifically. Of course. And I would never say never yeah. or ever. You know, you never say never and you never say always. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just my experience over the years. I, I do think, um, you know, keeping kids busy is very important. Mm -hmm. And I I do think if you want to have the best 16 year old in the world Mm. that you, you know, you, you pour the tennis in. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've seen a lot of 18 year olds, you know, come to college, uh, and be a little run down, uh, physically and emotionally. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think most kids tennis, starts to become more important when they're like 16. Okay. You know, having said that, you know, a lot of the great, great players um, of all time, you know, have <laughs> certainly not focused on school too hard and have focused more on their tennis. Mm-hmm. But I, I, it's just about being very smart about it. I think when kids are very young, um, it's easy for, to you know, they want to play more and more. They enjoy it. Um, but as they get older, they, they tend to break down and having a very good, you know, alternatives and cross training are, is really, really important. And 
And I really believe that, you know, if they're playing two or three hours a day, that's, that can be enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and too much of something is not the best sometimes. Okay. And so, you know, important cross training, important playing other sports. I mean, again, you know, you need to look at, and certainly this crop that's coming up now, uh, Riley Opelka, Francis TFO, uh, Tommy Paul, um, they certainly had a certain way. But you know, the other guys like Steve and Sam and Isner and, you know, you can go back to Andy Roddick. You know, he played high school basketball. Mm-hmm. I do think having that cross training is very good for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, becoming the best athlete you can become is super important. I think... You know, a lot of the the European players are such incredible soccer players. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I was never too much of a soccer fan. (laughs) I played soccer as a a kid, but I don't think many people would call it soccer. (laughs) It was kind of chasing a ball. But, you know, watching my three boys come up and then my last son uh, played soccer at the club level. And that was something he was really passionate about and really enjoyed it. And, and I could see how that really helped his his coordination because soccer you play from the right side of your body and the left side of your body. Mm-hmm. So you know there's a lot of sprinting, a lot of running. It's it's a little it's a lot like tennis. Mm-hmm. You know, tennis at the highest level is played with your feet and your head. Mm-hmm. Um, so working on your footwork, working on your toughness, working on your lungs working on your legs, that's all that soccer does. Mm -hmm. So I I think that really helps, and it also gives them, you know, they're not so into just tennis, um, which I I think over the long haul is great, you know, that they have other things to take that burden off tennis. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think trying to become the best 22-year-old is what, you know, how I would train you know, a tennis player and and using tennis to build a person up emotionally is really important. And that's why I talk about coaching in a very positive way Mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to do all those things in a, in a super positive way. And that can be hard to do. And, you know, it's, it's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for a lot of coaches, but you know, that's, that's really important. So, you know, I've seen that through, whatever homeschooling whatever you want to call it Mm -hmm. um you know that too much can be too much and it doesn't mean you can't do it properly Mm -hmm. and do it right uh but it's it's just a lot tougher way to go uh i know i homeschooled all my kids for a certain period of time and i would say even though i learned lessons with with each of them Mm -hmm. each of them was a bit of a disaster in its own way. Uh, so if I had to do it over again, I probably would not have homeschooled any of them. Oh, wow. Just from a, like you said, you've had your own disasters, but just from a personal standpoint, it seems like you have to get through it a couple of times in order to figure out what's the right path, right? Even with coaching, you, you took a while to fi- find your own coaching strategy and your own like you said, positivity, you try to stay positive rather than bring like pointing out all the negatives. It takes some time to develop that. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's important. It's important. Just oh. proving I'm, I'm quarantined. I'm, I'm Howard Hughes for 24 hours. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, even... I was thinking. But yeah, I, I think everything is learning. You yeah. know, you're, you know, I'm 50. I just turned 56. And, Congratulations. And, uh, yeah, 56 yeah, years young. Made it. Uh, but yeah, uh, hopefully I'm a smarter person and smarter coach than I was a year ago. And mm. certainly I, I know I'm smarter than I was 10 years ago and you're always learning and you're always getting through certain circumstances and you, you're just always trying to become better and, you know, in tennis and in life, if you've ever think you've made it, you're, <laughs> then you're doomed. Uh, so you got to enjoy that process and, and keep, keep going. I, uh, yeah, I totally agree, and I really appreciate you taking time out of your day, out of your quarantine bubble, to come talk to us about <laughs> Sam and Steve and your college coaching career. And 
Uh, I really hope you guys are staying safe in the bubble. I really hope you guys have a very successful Western, Western and Southern Open and U.S. Open. Hopefully they're still happening, knock on wood. And I, I really appreciate it, Peter. Yeah, U.S. Open, USTA seems to be, I'll tell you what, they're, they're pretty serious here. So Good. they're taking this seriously. And uh, hopefully we can pull it off and some people can watch some different tennis. I think it's going to be very different with no fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, but hopefully it's some great tennis. So, you know, I've been really enjoyed watching some of the other sports on tennis, mm-hmm. on TV, uh, <clears throat> besides tennis. So hopefully everyone sees some good tennis. So. You know, it won't be hard to spot the coaches in the crowd, that's for sure. I totally agree, and I really appreciate it again, Peter. Take care. You got it, Phil.